Hi, it's Jerry Williams, and I have great news. My new book, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, is now out and available worldwide as an ebook, paperback, and hardback wherever books are sold. I'll tell you more after the intro. So, cue the music. Welcome to episode 172 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show the public who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case review with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agent Wason Dunn, who served in the FBI for 30 years. During his time in the field, he worked counterintelligence, high technology theft, domestic terrorism, and violent crime matters. In this episode, Wason reviews a case targeting an extremist group, espousing posse comitatus rhetoric and white supremacist views. Initially, under investigation for weapons and interstate theft violations, the leader, Michael Ryan, his 15-year-old son, Dennis, and others were eventually charged and convicted of the violent and horrific deaths of two group members. After the successful conclusion of this case, Wason Dunn steadily moved up the ranks of the FBI, serving in a variety of mid-level leadership and management positions, and then senior executive status. He received numerous awards, including the Presidential Meritorious Executive Rank Award conferred by the President of the United States in recognition of sustained leadership and accomplishment. At the time of his retirement, Wason Dunn was the longest-serving incumbent special agent in charge, consecutively serving as the head of the Springfield, Illinois Division, the Newark, New Jersey Division, and the Omaha Division for a total of nine years. Appointed by the governor of Nebraska, Wason Dunn currently serves as a commissioner of the Nebraska Crime Commission. He also sits on several boards, including the Omaha Police Foundation. He is active as a community volunteer leader for the American Red Cross. The sometimes shocking episode presented by Wason Dunn just shows us what evil people will do to others in the false name of God. I need to warn you that some of the descriptions of violence are intense. But before we get to the interview, I want to sincerely thank all of you, especially my launch team members, for your help in spreading the word about FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives. I'm recording this before the official June 27th launch date, but I'm hoping for a fabulous response from my FBI retired case file review listeners. I wrote FBI myths and misconceptions, especially for you. This manual will help you create realistic FBI characters and plots for your next book or script, impress your armchair detective friends with your knowledge about the FBI, and prepare for a career in the FBI and avoid embarrassing yourself at Quantico. In each chapter, I review one of my 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI in books, TV, and movies. If you do pick up a copy of FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, and you enjoy the book, please don't forget to leave a review. Reviews help readers find good books. There is a direct link to the FBI Myths and Misconceptions sales page at Amazon.com and other major retailers in your podcatcher's description of this episode. Thank you. Now here's the show. I am excited to introduce my guest, Wason Dunn. Hi, Wason. How are you? Hello, Jerry. How are you today? I'm doing great. Actually, you know, I've mentioned you several times 
on this podcast, but not by name. I've uh, quoted you, uh, but didn't attribute the quote to you. And that is failing at retirement. Do you remember saying that to me? <laughs> yes, I uh, often say that. <laughs> Well, I've been using it. I, I, I stole it from you because I think it really talks about the FBI culture and how so many of us, even after we retire uh, and even retire from maybe a, a second post FBI job, we just feel this need to keep working. And so I love that. And to give people a taste of how you're failing, how how badly you're failing at retirement. Can you give us a, a, a quick review of what you're doing now? Well, certainly, and you're absolutely right. Uh, many FBI agents, after spending a career in public service uh, and in service to the, their community and nation, find it hard to just stop doing that, and they don't want to stop. And I guess I fall in that category because after I retired, Although I did a little bit of consulting work, uh, that's a very, very small percentage of my time. I was very fortunate uh, here in Nebraska, where I now live, the governor appointed me as a commissioner of the Nebraska Crime Commission. So that is an official state position. Um, the Crime Commission in Nebraska oversees police training and, and police certification. And it also administers a variety of federal grants for state county and local institutions that have to do with criminal justice, uh, victims assistance, uh, and other law enforcement or criminal justice matters. Uh, in addition to being a commissioner on the Crime Commission, I also spend a lot of time volunteering. Uh, I serve on a number of nonprofit boards, uh, and I also am a volunteer leader with the American Red Cross. I'm the volunteer partner to the Red Cross CEO for our region. Uh, and also help out during disasters with government liaison, public affairs, and a number of other things. Yeah, it sounds like you're pretty busy. So uh, I'm so glad that we were able to schedule this case review because the case itself is unbelievable. Uh, and, and actually, this is going to be the third case review that I've done this year on extremist groups and, and hate organizations. So why don't we get started? Why don't you tell us a little bit about the group and, and how you became the case agent in this very violent and horrific case? Yeah, absolutely. It, it was a horrific case. Uh, it was probably one of the most bizarre and also disturbing cases in my 30-year FBI career. Uh, I often say this one is almost something uh, as though it was a horror movie, even though, sadly, it was real life. So this case dealt with a domestic extremist group that existed here in Nebraska in the early 1980s. And at that time, I was still a very young agent. In fact, I only had about two and a half years, uh, three years in the Bureau when I was transferred to the Omaha Field Office, which covers all of Nebraska and Iowa. And because I was one of the younger agents and the new kid in the office, I was assigned to be responsible for all domestic terrorism and domestic extremism investigations in the entire state of Nebraska. Now, I have to explain that back in that day, in the early 80s, terrorism was not the high priority that it is now. Uh, back then, terrorism cases were the ones that no one wanted to work because, frankly, the terrorism threat was not perceived as being that great. And uh, as the new kid, I got the lead to do all the domestic terrorism cases in Nebraska because all the senior guys wanted to do the more traditional things that were a higher priority at that time, such as your bank robberies and your drug trafficking and white collar crimes and the like. So as a very young agent, uh, I was given the lead to investigate domestic terrorism. Extremist groups in Nebraska at that time primarily emanated from right-wing extremist groups that had a combination of what was known as the Christian identity ideology, as well as the sovereign citizen ideology. Uh, the Christian identity ideology was one which espoused basically a white supremacy viewpoint. Uh, their belief was that the only true descendants of Jesus, if you will, uh, were the white Aryan race and that all others uh, were not. And then the sovereign citizen type of ideology was basically one in which 
they believe that governments really have no authority, that the individual is sovereign, and in particular, they really disdained the federal government. So in the 1980s, uh, the other thing that was happening uh, around the world, actually, but particularly particularly in the Midwest, was that there was a agricultural economic crisis, uh, crisis rather, I'm sorry, an agricultural economic crisis where uh, farmers were, were struggling because prices for the uh, goods that they were producing were dropping and many farmers were finding it difficult to pay their bills. Uh, many started losing their farms to foreclosure and, and to other sorts of dire actions. So a lot of people were really suffering here in the Midwest during the farm, farm crisis of the 80s. And some of these extremist groups took advantage of that suffering and started to appeal to all of these agricultural communities where there was really economic hardship. And their appeal was basically that it's not your fault, it's the fault of whatever group they chose to, to highlight. And that's where some of the Christian identity beliefs came in. That's where some of the sovereign citizen beliefs came in because they would say, yeah, the federal government is taking your money and it's because of this uh, ethnic group or that ethnic group uh, and so forth. So the group that I was uh, ended up investigating was an offshoot of a group known as the Posse Comitatus, which is a Latin phrase that really uh, deals with a posse of the people, basically, posse of the common people or, or enforcement of law by common people. And the Posse Comitatus believed that the only legitimate uh, law enforcement authority was the elected sheriff. Uh, and that, of course, harkens back to the old days when the sheriffs had their posses. Now, I have to say, the only time they believed that was if the sheriff was sympathetic to them. So a sheriff who uh, was not working in their interests, in their view, they did not view as legitimate either. So in Nebraska, there were a variety of pockets of these groups, and most of them were just rhetoric. And of course, rhetoric is not illegal. Uh, a lot of talk, a lot of people held meetings, uh, rallies, if you will. But I started uh, hearing intelligence and, and really hearing rumors in some of the communities where I was developing contacts and trying to figure out what exactly was going on on the domestic terrorism front. I started hearing information and rumors about this group in far southeast Nebraska in a small farming community called Rulo. That's R-U-L-O, Rulo, Nebraska. It's still there. And these rumors basically said that a group of people had established an armed compound that was locked 24-7 under armed guard, allegedly, and people reportedly uh, heard sounds of gunfire at all times of the day to include uh, automatic weapons, machine guns. They also heard rumors that these people were stockpiling weapons and stockpiling explosives, uh, and really just all sorts of very strange things were being reported. And again, this group was very reclusive, and um, they, were, they never allowed anybody onto the property. So I started looking into it because one of the rumors, one of the uh, bits of intelligence we got was that this group may be affiliated with a posse comitatus. Wayson, I, I know you probably said this, but could you remind us what year this is? Uh, this was 19, uh, be between 1984 and 1986 was at the height of all of this activity. And do you remember when Waco occurred? That was much later, wasn't it? It, it was. Uh, Waco was uh, around uh, 1990 time frame, somewhere in there. But what happened at Waco was eerily uh, similar. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. In fact, sometimes I refer to Rulo as kind of a, a precursor and small scale model for Waco. And when I, when I get into the story in depth, you'll see that the individual that headed up this small group in Ru Rulo, Nebraska, had many of the same characteristics, behaviors, uh, and activities as David Koresh at Waco. Anyway, the rumor was that this group was part of the Posse Comitatus. And again, I want to remind everybody that just because you have these abhorrent, weird, uh, extremist beliefs, that is not illegal. But what is illegal is when you engage in violent action in furtherance of those beliefs. And the Posse Comitatus at that time, in the early 1980s, had already had a number of violent crimes, uh, violent assaults attributed to it. And there were some other groups at that time, most notably one known as the Aryan Nations, that had actually murdered law enforcement officials, murdered minority um, members of the media, 
the reason I started investigating this group was a combination of the fact that they were reportedly uh, somehow tied to the Posse Comitatus, which again had, had acts of criminal violence attributed to it already, and also the reports of the sounds of machine gun fire, because machine guns do violate federal law unless you have the appropriate uh, registration and all that. And uh, I was pretty confident that these people did not have legally registered machine guns if, in fact, they had machine guns. So uh, the basis for my investigation was to find out exactly what this group was up to and whether or not they had any illegal activity going on. I was really traveling throughout rural Nebraska trying to develop individuals who might have knowledge of what was going on in this little compound in Rulo. And really, no one had firsthand knowledge. Uh, it was all just uh, rumors. It was just all, well, I heard from so-and-so. And, you know, when I would track that down, they heard it from yet another person. Coincidentally, though, some members of this particular uh, group ended up getting arrested by the local police on a stolen farm equipment charge. They basically were pulling a stolen crop sprayer on a rural road in the middle of the night, uh, and sheriff's deputies spotted it because the sprayer had been reported stolen earlier. So they stopped the individuals uh, pulling the trailer, and it turns out they were two members of this group, so they were promptly put under arrest. Uh, and after that arrest, of course, when, when people realized they were part of this group, uh, there was a lot of attention brought to it. And the local newspaper uh, here in Omaha, the Omaha World Herald, actually ran an article uh, about this group, at least what they thought they knew about the group. And one of the bits of factual information that was in this newspaper article was an interview they conducted with the person that actually owned the land where this little compound was located. It was a, an older farmer by the name of Otho Stice. And he uh, was still the owner of the land. I believe he may have been a co-owner with his son. But he was interviewed by the newspaper, and he said what everybody else says. He says, I don't know what's going on there. Yeah, that, that used to be my farm. Uh, my son runs it for me now, but I'm not allowed on the property myself. And I think there's bad things going on, but I don't know for sure what's going on. And I'm worried about my son, and you know, I'm worried about his kids. So it was really just kind of a tale of woe. But upon reading that article, I said, hmm, that might be interesting to go talk to Mr. Stythe. So I just took it upon myself to drive down to Rulo, Nebraska. I was able to uh, find uh, Otho Stice's address, and I just went over to his house. Now, in that day, I first of all used the name Wayne as opposed to Wayson, because in rural Nebraska, it, it was just too complicated to try to explain the origins of the name Wayson, which does happen to be an Asian name, even though it doesn't sound Asian. So I went by Wayne, and I introduced myself as Wayne Dunn, an FBI agent. And I said, i just like to talk to you about what's going on on your farm. And he happened to be sitting on his front porch the day that I, I went to his house. And he was sitting on his porch, uh, snapping the ends off of a big bowl of green beans. Uh, and you do that before you prepare the beans, before you cook them. You have to snap the ends off, snap the, the stems off. I myself grew up in rural Missouri in a very small college town uh, where the only other industry outside of the college was primarily agriculture. So I was very familiar with what he was doing and I knew how to do it. It's not that difficult. So I said, tell you what, I said, how about if I give you a hand snapping the stems off those uh, green beans uh, while we talk? And of course, he accepted my help. So we, we just visited for probably 45 minutes to an hour. And he really didn't tell me anything that I didn't already know because he kept saying, you know, they, they, I can't get on my own farm. Uh, they won't let me on there. And I'm very concerned about what's going on, but I don't really know what's going on because they don't show me anything. And he again expressed um, concern for his son, who uh, su was supposed to be running the farm. So I said, you know what? I said, maybe if I talk to your son, I can help him out because he also said his son was concerned about his, his son's kids or, his, or Otho's grandkids. I said, I'd, I'd like to talk to your son. Maybe I can help him out. I said, I can't make any promises, but if, if he can help me understand what's going on there and what his problems are, I might be able to help him or at least find somebody that can. So that was that, and I didn't know if anything would come of it. So about um, maybe two weeks, maybe three weeks after I visited uh, with Mr. Stice, the elder Mr. Stice, one evening I get a phone call at home from the FBI switchboard. And they tell me there's a fellow on the phone named Rick Stice, and he wants to talk to me and ask me if that's okay. And I said, absolutely. I said, um, patch him right through to my home. Of course, I would never give anybody my home phone number. I always gave him the FBI office number because the office had the ability to patch the calls through. 
So uh, Rick Stice gets passed through. Uh, I, I talk to him and he basically starts the conversation by saying, my dad said I should talk to you because he thought you might be able to help me. And I said, well, Rick, I might be able to, but you've got to tell me what's going on. You've got to let me know everything that's going on down there and, and why you're concerned and why you're fearing for your safety. And I said, I'd, I'd just like to meet with you and talk to you. Before you move on, I'd like to stop and, and recognize the unique rapport building <laughs> skills that you uh, that that you initiated because you always see on TV where law enforcement officers are threatening and and trying to coerce people into talking to them, and we know that in the FBI, you know, building a rapport and making people feel comfortable is really the best way to get people to to talk, to want to talk to you. And I have to give you credit for the bean snapping method. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yes, that, that one probably is not in the FBI manual anywhere. And I doubt it's ever been used since or by anyone else. But, but it, it just... worked. But it worked. <laughs> Well, it did, you know, because uh, I realized that in order for this gentleman to hear me out, because he was obviously a little bit wary, I would I would have to give him a reason and also let him know that I meant no harm. And that basically I was, you know, just uh, another rural kid, because as I said, I grew up in Missouri. I think I think I may have told him that I may have said, you know, I grew up in a small town in Missouri, which, of course, is right across the river. And and I, I felt I wanted him to be able to trust me because obviously, even if he wouldn't talk, my, my goal was to get him to ask his son to talk to me, which he did. Now, Rick was a lot harder. So Rick calls me again. I you know, went through my whole whole spiel saying, I would like to visit with you. I might be able to help you, but I, I can't make any promises. And I don't know if I can until we talk. Well, he was very hesitant. He basically said, I'm not sure I want to talk to you. I don't think it'd be safe for me to do that. I think he even said it may not even be safe for me to be calling you right now. But my dad said I ought to call you and talk to you. And he thought you might be able to help me. And I said, well, Rick, give me a chance. I said, let's let's get together and, and you need to tell me what's going on and I'll see if I can help you. And he basically said, well, I'm going to have to think about that because I'm not really ready to do that yet. And he says, I'll call you after I think about it if, if I think I'm willing to do that. So, you know, I was hoping he would call back, but one never knows in these situations. And it was about another week and a half, maybe two weeks again, I get another call at night from the FBI switchboard saying it's Rick Stice it's on the phone. He wants to talk to you. So this time, of course, I pick up the phone and after some brief, brief pleasantry, he said, I said, OK, Rick, um, you obviously want to talk to me because you call me back. So when can we get together? Well, he was still a little hesitant, but he says, you know, how do I know you really are an FBI agent? And I, you know, went through the whole thing about, well, you called the FBI office, didn't you? And, and you know, I gave your dad my business card. It says FBI on it. Uh, and I said, I can prove it when we meet. But he was just very hesitant. He says, finally, he says, you know what? You could be making all this up. That could have been anybody that answered the phone. He says, um, I'm willing to talk to you if you'll bring somebody that I know for sure is a good guy and is in law enforcement. And I said, well, who'd you have in mind? And Rick Stice said, well, how about Terry Becker? Well, I happen to know who Terry Becker was. Terry Becker was a highly respected uh, in investigator for the Nebraska State Patrol. And in fact, I had been working with several people in Nebraska State Patrol on these matters because they were obviously also concerned about these reports of extremist activity and, and you know, the potential for gun violence and, and the thefts that they were committing. So I contacted Terry and said, hey, Terry, would you be uh, willing to accompany me to go talk to Rick Stice? And Terry was actually surprised. He says, what? He says, you heard from Rick Stice? And I said, yeah. And he says, I've been trying to get in touch with him. For several weeks, and he's just kind of disappeared. Nobody seems to know where he is. Uh, so where is he? And I said, well, I actually don't know where he is either. But I said, he's called me twice now, and he's willing to meet if you'll come with me, because he knows you as, an, as a state trooper, and he trusts you. So Terry said, sure. So, um, you know, Rick called me back a few days later. That was the arrangement. So I told Rick, I said, okay, Terry's willing to come. Uh, we'll come meet you and we'll talk to you. And Rick said, well, I'm, I'm just, I don't think I'm comfortable coming back into Nebraska to meet. And he said, how about we meet in Sedalia, Missouri, which was about a, uh, it's about a five hour drive from Omaha where the FBI office was based. And I said, well, why do you want to meet there? And he says, well, he says, I feel safe there. I just think if I come back to Nebraska, it's going to be too dangerous for me. So if you and Terry want to come see me in Sedalia, you're going to have to come see me. Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to go there. 
So, of course, Terry and I uh, made arrangements to go to Sedalia, and it was just the two of us. Now, I will say my uh, supervisor, who happened to also be the assistant special agent in charge of the office, uh, he said, uh, after he approved my trip and my travel, he said, I want to send another agent to provide cover for you guys. He said, he's not going to be part of the interview, but because of the known violence of the posse and because of all the rumors about, you know, machine guns in this place and because of what's happened in other parts of the country, he says, I'm just worried that maybe you guys are being set up, that you and Terry Becker are being set up by by this group for something. And of course, I said, sure, that's fine. Uh, you know, of course, I even appreciated his concern along those lines. So they did send another agent that basically shadowed us. Uh, he was not part of the interview, but he was watching the whole time from a discreet distance. You talked about going to Missouri, and I take it that that's a whole different division. Yes, it, you, it is. Did you have uh, to involve any agents from that division? And, and what division is it? Uh, Sedalia would be covered out of the uh, Kansas City division still. Missouri is covered, half of it is covered by the Kansas City field office of the FBI, and the other half is covered by St. Louis. And because this was not an arrest, uh, it was not any kind of a law enforcement operation, it was simply us meeting an individual uh, and, and trying to interview him. Uh, we did not need any assistance from the other field office. I did notify the Kansas City field office, specifically the RA, the resident agency out of Kansas City that covers the Sedalia area, and let them know we were going to be there, let them know what we were doing as a courtesy, because that's, that's common. It's a common courtesy in the FBI. If you go into another field office's territory, you notify them. Uh, so we did that, but we also let them know we did not need any assistance. And in fact, we didn't really want to have uh, a lot of presence because we were hoping to develop an individual as a source into something that was going on into Nebraska. So uh, they were very accommodating. The Kansas City office said, sure, let us know if you need anything. Otherwise, just be careful and good luck. So we did notify them. So we meet Rick at a uh, what was then a, a very popular chain of restaurants called Rax. It's spelled R-A-X. It's, uh, it's basically a, a typical American uh, diner style type of restaurant. So we meet uh, Rick at this Rax restaurant and he is just visibly scared to be seen with us. Uh, he was very, very nervous. He really didn't tell us much more than what we already knew. He was very hesitant to answer any questions. I think he really just wanted to see me and to see Terry and make sure we were in fact you know, really, really, it was the two of us and there was nobody else there and, and that nothing bad would happen. And of course, nothing did. So we didn't get much information out of him, but he did agree to meet with us again. So uh, we, we met a couple more times. Each, each of these meetings was separated by maybe a week or two weeks. And each time we had to travel to a different location. And each time Terry and I met with him, he seemed a little more relaxed and would just dribble out bits of information. And some of the bits of information he dribbled out were that really bad things were going on at the farm and that he himself had fallen out of favor with the leader of this group, uh, the leader of the group being a fellow named Mike Ryan. And he said that he had fallen out of favor with Mike Ryan and had actually been demoted in rank. Uh, he told us they had a rank structure in this group on the farm. And at one time, he had been a general and Mike Ryan was the, the supreme commander, if you will. But Rick said that after he fell out of favor, um, he was demoted multiple times down to the point where he was regarded as a slave. And through the subsequent meetings, he began tell, telling us some kind of unbelievable and horrific details about how he was beaten, uh, how he was uh, chained up at night and he had to sleep outside on the porch uh, like an animal. And he also started telling us that his young son, a five-year-old boy, was being abused by Mike Ryan. And some of the things that he told us that Mike had done to his son, his son was named Luke, were just absolutely horrific. I, I won't go into detail here, but I, I will just say they were very, very horrific, very cruel things that were done to this young boy. And um, it, it was just unbelievable, the things that we were told. Of course, Terry and I were extremely concerned about hearing all this. And we kept saying to Rick, well, you know, is, is, is Luke all right now? I mean, you obviously won't go back there. Uh, is Luke still there? I mean, do we have a situation where we have a child that's being abused as we speak? And Rick would only say, no, no, Luke is safe now. Luke is fine now. So you don't need to worry about Luke. But then Rick said, 
I am still worried about uh, a fellow named James Tim. Uh, James Tim was another one of the uh, residents of this group, if you will, members of the group. And he said that James Tim had also fallen out of favor and had also been demoted and was also being beaten and abused. And he um, told us again of some horrific things that they had done to, to James Tim. Tim was a 19 year old man at the time, a young man. He was again, horrifically abused, horrifically tortured. And Rick said that when he escaped from the compound and he actually described us for us how he escaped and, and all that, he said that James uh, Tim was really in bad shape. And he says, you gotta find James Tim because I'm really worried if he's gonna make it or not. So Rick escaped during the time period when he was being treated similar to to uh, Tim? That is correct. He was not quite as severely beaten as James Tim. Rick escaped because even though he was kept under armed guard and pretty much watched 24-7, there were occasions when Mike Ryan, uh, the leader of the group, would send Rick into town. Uh, usually with another group member, and the other group's member who was supposed to guard Rick, uh, and they were always armed, but they would they would send Rick into town to run errands, always accompanied by another group member. And one time, they were sent into town, Rick and another member of the group were sent into town to cash some social security checks. Uh, again, that was one of the things that Ryan was doing. He was taking the social security checks that some of the other people in the group were receiving, and cashing them, of course, using the money however he wanted to. And Rick told us that when he and the fellow that was guarding him went into the store where they would cash these checks, Rick literally just ran out the back door. Uh, and he said the other guy just didn't chase him, probably because, you know, it wasn't a public place. It was a store. Rick said he just ran out, ran through the store, ran out the back and just kept running. And that's how he escaped. But he left his son behind. Well, that's what we were trying to figure out. That's why we asked him, where's Luke? And why he constantly said, Luke's fine now. Luke is safe now. But he would never tell us where he was. But he did tell us about the beatings of James Tim. Now, even though Rick was beaten pretty badly, James Tim really was was tortured. Uh, I mean, he was it was much more than being beaten. He was he was chained to um, a farrowing crate, which is a, a piece of, a piece of farm equipment. He he was stripped naked. They would not feed him. Uh, he had his fingertips shot off. Um, he was sexually abused. He also, at one point, Mike Ryan um, basically skinned portions of his body, uh, sliced off layers of skin. So James Chen was, was, was tortured. There was no other way to, t to describe it. And, and it was horrific things that you cannot imagine uh, human beings doing to each other. Yeah, of course, there is no justification for that type of treatment to another human being. But in Ryan's mind, Mike Ryan's mind, what had James Tim done to deserve such treatment? Well, this was another very unique aspect of the group, and this is where the group bore some similarities to Waco. You referenced Waco and David Koresh. Mike Ryan became the leader of the group originally because he and several of the other group members became friends at meetings of the Posse Comitatus. They had all attended a meetings of the Posse Comitatus together. They had, in fact, met each other initially at one of these meetings, and they be became friends. Now, Ryan was a very imposing fellow. He was the largest member of that group, the strongest, and he also did have, as many of these um, evil figures have, uh, a kind of a charismatic personality. Um, he had been a truck driver, but he uh, was, no, was no longer able to drive because of some disability, but he was still pretty formidable physically. And he wove this tale that is really unbelievable when you think about it, but he convinced everybody on the compound. And the tale that he told them, the, the persona that he created for himself as the leader of this group was, first of all, he claimed to have had a military background. He claimed to have worked for the CIA and other unnamed intelligence agencies. Of course, that was all fault, uh, false. But the most outrageous claim was he told the group members and he convinced the group members that he was actually the reincarnation of the Archangel Michael. 
You know, again, his name was Michael Ryan, and he convinced these people that he was the Archangel Michael reincarnated and that he could speak directly with God. Now, he didn't refer to God as God. He referred to God as Yahweh, as did all the other members uh, of this group. And this was kind of affiliated with, uh, as I mentioned, the Christian identity movement. So this was the element of Christian identity that they kind of threw into it. They believed in the white extremist viewpoint, the supremacy of the white race. They were going so far as, as to rewriting the Bible to indicate that the members of the Aryan race were the, were the real Israelites, if you will. They also rewrote portions of the Bible. You know, instead of saying thou shall not kill, they said thou shall kill and things of that nature. And not only was Rick telling us that they were doing all this, Ryan was the one who was rewriting the Bible. But as if I skip forward, we actually recovered Mike Ryan's Bible uh, when we ultimately uh, arrested all these folks. And you could see in the Bible, in his handwriting, where he had crossed out entire sentences and rewritten them in the margin the way he thought they should read. So that's just an aside. But he convinced these people that he was the archangel. And the way he allegedly communicated with God was through the means of what he described as the arm test. And the arm test was actually something used by some of these other uh, domestic extremist groups and some of these other quasi-religious groups. The arm test basically required two people who were true believers, again, in their terms, you had to be a true believer. And one person would ask the question, and the other person was supposed to hold their arm straight out in front of them, horizontal to the ground. So hold their arm straight out, you know, like you're pointing at something, but just hold your arm straight out. And the person asking the question would always ask a yes or no question. And then if they could push the the other person's arm down, the answer would be yes. If they could not push the arm down, the answer would be no. And that was how they supposedly uh, communicated with God. Now, as Rick described it to me, and in fact, I I asked him, I said, so, uh, you know, who usually asked the questions and whose arm was usually used? And he says, well, we all participated, but most of the time it was Mike Ryan asking the questions. And it was, you know, either me or or, uh, James Tim or one of the women or, you know, one of the other people on the compound um, that would uh, whose arm he would use. And I said, well, did it ever occur to you that maybe Mike is the strongest of all of you? And Rick said, well, he probably was the strongest, but this really does work. And, you know, Rick really believed that. They all really believed it. You may wonder, how did Mike Ryan convince these people that he had this power, that he was the archangel reincarnated and that he could communicate directly with God? Yeah, it is absolutely amazing to me when, when you hear about these I guess, almost cult situations, you know, how they're able to get people to believe in some of the most, you know, bizarre things that they do in the name of God. Yes. Well, I was able to figure out how Ryan did that. I mean, first of all, the fact that he was the strongest and most imposing person there was was, was a large part of it, but he was also very clever and very manipulative. And what he would do is any any time somebody did something that displeased him, he would say, he wouldn't say, you made me mad or that you disobeyed my order. It was always, you've displeased Yahweh or you've displeased Yahweh's order. Because any time Mike Ryan gave them an order, even though Mike was the self-appointed supreme general of this group, he always phrased it as, Yahweh wants you to do this. It was never, I want you to do this. So if somebody disobeyed him, they were disobeying Yahweh in the way that Mike Ryan would phrase it. So anytime someone did anything that was not exactly the way he wanted or that in some way displeased him, he would look for the next opportunity where something unfortunate happened to that person, no matter how minor. And he would say, that's your punishment. So I'll give you an example. If somebody, for example, one of the, there were numerous women there and there were some other young men there Luke was the only real child. All the others were uh, teenagers or older. But if somebody failed to clean the table, let's say after dinner, or failed to do their chores properly, uh, Mike Ryan would say, you know, you you failed Yahweh. You you didn't um, clean the table tonight. 
And then if the next day that person just happened to stub their toe or maybe they were building something and hit their thumb with a hammer uh, or, or even just tripped, you know, on an uneven piece of ground, anything like that happened, Mike, Mike Ryan would say, that was your punishment for disobeying Yahweh yesterday. And repeatedly he would do that. So anytime something didn't go his way, the next time anything bad happened, no matter how minor, or major, in some cases it was major. It could even be something like, you know, somebody uh, gets a flat tire. Uh, he would say, that's your punishment for what you did yesterday. I got a taste of this myself because after I developed a fair amount of intelligence into what was going on, I really wanted to go down there and try to talk to Mike Ryan and talk to some of these other people. And uh, actually, I was also at, that, at this time, this was before I actually met with Rick Stice, I was also trying to uh, get in touch with Rick because nobody knew where he was. And the assumption was that he was still there because again, it was his farm or his father's farm. I had actually driven down to this compound myself and um, it's out, out in, in rural uh, Southeast Nebraska. Uh, I drive up to the gate. The gate is uh, chained solidly with multiple chains and multiple locks. And there's a huge sign on it that says no trespassing. And, and so of course I honored that. But I was close enough, the gate was close enough to the farmhouse that I basically identified myself, you know, by shouting out uh, who I was. And, and I just wanted to talk to somebody. Would somebody please come to the gate? Because I could tell there were, there were people inside the, uh, the structures, inside the houses. Uh, Mike Ryan himself soon came down. I recognized him because I knew what he looked like. I'd seen his photos. Uh, and he introduced himself as Mike. And I said, I introduced myself as Wayne Dunn with the FBI. And his first words were, I knew you'd be here today. And I said, excuse me? And he says, yes. He says, uh, God told me the FBI was going to be coming today. And I said, really? I said, how did he do that? And Mike said, well, this morning, two blackbirds flew over. And I knew that was God's sign that the FBI was going to be here today. Oh, that uh, makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that that <laughs> makes exactly. a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I just said, oh, really? Uh, well. So I started to ask him about what was going on at the farm. And of course, he denied everything. Uh, he claimed that uh, nothing illegal was going on. He claimed that, uh, you know, it was, it was, they were just trying to, you know, make a living farming. And I said, well, what about the fact that uh, two, of, two of the guys that used to be on this farm were arrested with stolen farm equipment a few weeks ago? Because by then that had, that had occurred. And he he says, oh, well, I didn't approve of that. Uh, they were just doing that. They shouldn't have done that. I had no idea they were involved in such things. Uh, he basically denied everything and, and uh, would admit nothing. Well, let so, me ask you this question, Wayson. Did you, mm -hmm. did you go out there by yourself? I mean, there have been reports of gunfire and, and automatic weapons. Uh, yes, but there had never been any reports that they had actually ever hurt anyone. And most of the people, I mean, we knew who some of the people were there. Um, there, there was a, another farm couple from Kansas, for example. We knew they were living there. Uh, we knew James Tim was supposed to be living there, al although his family had not heard from him. None of these people had any history of violence. All the people that we knew about were what you could describe as, you know, good, solid, solid Midwestern rural farm people. So no history of violence at all. Right. Solid Midwestern farm people who did not necessarily have much love or respect for people of color. Oh, uh, that is true. Um, you know, interestingly, I never, you know, I never, I guess, really thought about my ethnicity. My ethnicity is Asian. And, and as I mentioned, I use the name Wayne instead of Wayson. But, you know, throughout my travels, I guess probably because I grew up in rural Missouri, I was really quite comfortable in those environments. And um, I think people were usually fairly comfortable with me. In fact, I'll tell you a story about the sheriff in a moment. But the reason I went by myself was, first of all, there had been no reports of, of any kind of violence. We knew the people there. None of them had a violent background, despite the rumors about the gunfire. But again, you know, just because you hear gunfire, that's not necessarily illegal. That's not all that unusual in, in rural areas, but it is unusual in, if it's automatic gunfire. And it's also unusual when you hear it constantly, which was what was being rumored there. But the other reason that I, I went alone was I was really hoping again to try to develop some sources to gain some cooperation. And because of the fact I knew that they were kind of anti-government and also because I did not want to provoke anything, uh, you know, I didn't want to show up with a lot of people. I didn't want it to look like it was any kind of a an enforcement operation because it wasn't. I really just wanted to talk to them and see what was going on. I did, of course, notify 
in my office uh, exactly where I was going, what time I was due back and, and all that. So if anything did happen, uh, obviously, if I didn't return, when I was supposed to, they would know where I had gone. But uh, it was probably a calculated risk. Uh, in retrospect, maybe maybe it was too much of a risk after I uh, found out what was really going on there. But at the time, it seemed like a reasonable risk to take. You ask about you know my ethnicity and the fact that these people were definitely not keen on any minorities. While that's true on these people, I really never found that to be the case in my travels in, in, in the rural areas of Nebraska. I was generally, if I was treated with any kind of suspicion, it was because I was either from the big city or the FBI, uh, probably not because of my ethnicity. And part of that may have just been the way I carry myself. And also because I grew up in rural Missouri, I can I can talk like a typical rural Midwesterner. And I think that kind of disarmed some people. <laughs> so they weren't sure what to think of me. <laughs> But um, anyway, so I had, I had already met Mike Ryan and his comment about the Blackbirds was one way in which I think he had um, one indication of the way that he would manipulate these people. Because I'm sure he went back in the compound and said, yep, I knew the FBI guy was going to be here. And he was. I mean, I'm sure he said that, even though I don't know that for a fact. But so he, he had convinced these people that he was able to communicate with God. He convinced these people that he was all knowing and all powerful. Um, he ended up not only being the supreme commander of this group, and there were about 15 people in total there, but of the many women there, he ended up taking multiple women as his wives in the, in the eyes of Yahweh, and he would perform the marriage ceremony himself. And he was already married, and his wife was there on the compound, but she put up with this. I mean, he had multiple wives on the compound or wives in the eyes of Yahweh. They, of course, were not really his wives. So it was very similar to what David Koresh had in terms of having uh, the multiple sexual partners. I guess that's a benefit of calling yourself Yahweh or, you know, godlike. Right. Oh, exactly. Well, he he was um, he pretty much had had his 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 will in his way, and uh, you know some people started disobeying him. I mean, Rick being one of them, James Timbling being one of them. And that's why they both fell out of favor. Now, there was another aspect of why Rick fell out of favor, uh, which Rick was pretty honest in telling me. Rick was a widower. He had been married. Uh, but his wife had tragically died of cancer, uh, and she was quite young. He wasn't that old himself anyway. He was, I think, I think late 20s, maybe early 30s. Um, so he was a widower, and one of the residents of this compound was a teenage girl. I believe her name was Lisa, if I recall correctly, Lisa Haverkamp. Uh, and the Haverkamp family, they had several members there. Now, Lisa was a teenager. She was of the legal age of consent, but she was still a teenager. But nonetheless, Mike Ryan decided that Lisa should be Rick's wife in the eyes of Yahweh. So Mike Ryan performed a marriage ceremony for them. But the stipulation was when Mike Ryan made Lisa Rick's wife on the farm and in the eyes of Yahweh, the stipulation was Rick was not allowed to consummate the marriage. He was not allowed to have any kind of sexual relations with Lisa. Rick doesn't know why Mike said that. Um, after all was said and done, Rick was speculating that maybe Mike wanted to save Lisa for himself someday, perhaps. But regardless, that was a stipulation. And Rick disobeyed that. Rick ended up uh, having uh, sexual relations with Lisa, his, his, his wife in the eyes of Yahweh. And she ended up getting pregnant. And that's when Mike Ryan, of course, found out that his order had been disobeyed. And that's when Rick Stice was demoted from being one of the um, leaders of the group to ending up being the slave and being beaten and, and being subjected to to all the other abuses to oh. include watching his son being abused. And was that that baby Luke? Was Luke the baby, the five-year-old? He was the, fi he was the five-year-old. Which brings me to the next next really major development in the story. As I said, I've kind of given you some of the background, but we w met with Rick a number of times, and each time we met with him, he would tell us a little bit more, a little bit more. And he had told us about, about the horrible abuses that, that Luke, his five-year-old son, had been subjected to at the hands of Mike Ryan. But when we asked about Luke and expressed concern about, you know, if, if we have a child being abused right now, that's something we'll move on right now. Rick would always say, no, Luke is safe. Luke is fine now. He said, what I'm really worried about is James Tim. I think James Tim, I'm worried if he's going to make it because when I escaped, James Tim was in really bad shape. So it was probably the third or fourth meeting uh, with Rick. Uh, again, this was at a restaurant. This time we were, I think, in uh, near Hiawatha, Kansas. That's a small town in northeast Kansas. We were again meeting Rick in a, in a roadside diner. 
and Terry and I go and sit down with Rick and, and we, we were, you know, exchanging the usual pleasantries. And every time we met with him, we would always say, how's Luke? Because he'd already, he'd already, he'd, he had told us about Luke and about some of the horrific abuses. And as I told you, each time he would say, Luke's fine, Luke's safe. Well, this time when I asked him, how's Luke? Rick just blurted out, Luke's dead. And Terry and I both said, what? And Rick said, Luke's dead. And I said, I think I was the one that kind of re regained my composure first. I said, what happened? How did he die? And Rick proceeded to tell, this, tell us this story about how Mike Ryan had become mad at Luke for something that the five-year-old had done. And on one particular day, Mike Ryan just struck him very violently and caused him to tumble headfirst into a bookcase. And Luke apparently hit his head lost consciousness and never regained consciousness. Rick was not allowed to be with his son when he died. Again, Rick was chained up outside every night and Luke died sometime in the night uh, while Rick was chained up outside. Uh, Rick, you know, tried to revive him, of course, uh, uh, earlier when he, when he passed out after he hit his head and was unable to do so. And then what really was horrifying, Rick tells us that Mike Ryan then forced Rick to go dig a grave and bury his own son on the property. So uh, Terry and I, of course, were shocked and horrified, speechless for a while. You know, I took copious notes. We documented every detail that Rick could remember with regard to how Luke had been struck, all the things that had been done to him, what happened on the day that he died, and how he was buried, how Rick was forced to bury his own son. And of course, I then called my supervisor and I said, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you because I still don't believe it. But I relayed the whole story to him. And uh, of course, Terry and I both, when we called our, our respective supervisors, said this case has taken a whole new dimension now. We're not just looking at possible illegal weapons or, or possible stockpiling of explosives. We're looking at, a we know, one homicide. We, we got We got to move quickly. Well, that makes me feel a lot better about Rick, knowing that he didn't escape and, and leave his young son behind. Uh, his son had been dead all along when he first started telling you, uh, talking and uh, talking to you and, and sharing uh, what had happened to him. Yes, exactly. And, and, and in fact, we asked him about that. We said, Rick, you know, you kept telling us Luke is fine. And, and Rick said, yeah, he's in heaven. He's fine now. He's safe. So, you know, that was, uh, that was one of the weirder things about the case because Rick was so, uh, he was so frightened. And one of the things he really thought Mike Ryan was omniscient and that Mike Ryan knew he was meeting with us and that Mike Ryan knew everything he told us. I mean, he, he believed that sincerely, but I think we gained his trucks to the point that he just blurted out what he did because uh, I think he just needed to tell somebody. And up, up until that point, nobody outside the compound knew uh, that Luke Stice had been killed. So now Terry and I were faced with a dilemma. We knew a homicide had been created, but we had no proof of it other than Rick Stice's word. And the story was such an incredulous story, as well as such a horrific story, that we realized this isn't something a judge and jury is going to believe with no evidence. Because as I said at the very outset, it's like something out of a horror movie. So the plan we came up with was we're going to have to corroborate Rick Stice as a reliable informant. We are going to have to have him tell us about every single crime that he can remember that they've committed. And they had committed a lot of minor property crimes. But um, Rick had an incredibly good memory, and he actually walked us through over days of debriefings every single theft that they created because uh, they, that they had perpetrated. Because what this group was doing to finance their activities, in addition to cashing the social security checks that some of them were getting, they were going out almost on a weekly basis and stealing farm equipment. They were stealing equipment from construction sites. They were stealing cattle uh, off of people's farms and ranches and selling them. So Rick was able to tell us about every theft that he could remember every cattle theft, every theft of construction equipment, which side it was, what construction company. And Terry and I spent several months then basically corroborating every one of these thefts. I mean, we would go to the original site of the theft, interview people, document that, yes, in fact, the theft had occurred. If a police report had been filed, we would retrieve the police report. One hadn't been filed, we would just document what had happened. We would you know, try to get serial numbers, uh, try to get descriptions of cattle, brands and the like. And then we would, based on the information Rick told us, 
try to trace where they had sold this stuff for money. So we were going to sale barns and livestock auctions and pawn shops, uh, again, documenting, did so-and-so bring in a VCR, or did so-and-so bring in an electric drill, or did so-and-so bring in you know this piece of farm equipment on such and such a date. And we were able to corroborate every one of these thefts, to include the cattle thefts. Um, I, I remember going to auction barns and confirming how many heads of cattle with what kind of brand were sold by so-and-so on such a date. And that coincided with what Rick told us that they had stolen. So after we corroborated probably a dozen or more of these property crimes, we had enough that we could say, okay, he is providing credible information. Therefore, we believe that the information he has about the homicide of his own son is credible and corroborated. So with that information, we obtained a arrest warrant, first of all, from Mike Ryan on charges of interstate transportation of stolen cattle or stolen livestock is what the charging sheet actually reads. Uh, and that is a federal crime. It's similar to interstate transportation of stolen property. It's a federal crime with a 20 year maximum sentence. So it's a pretty, pretty serious crime. The reason we charged Mike Ryan with that originally, and we also charged James Haverkamp, uh, one of the other uh, members of this group because they were the two leaders and we wanted to be able to arrest the two leaders, remaining leaders of the group and really isolate them because our plan was to go arrest them and execute a search warrant to go look for Luke's body as well as to look for, look for other items of stone equipment. And then finally, we were going to obviously detain everybody else on the compound, separate them and interview them individually. We had interview teams set up uh, so that everybody would be interviewed simultaneously. We wrote out scripts and questions and gave extensive briefings so every interview team knew exactly what to ask and what it, had what it transpired. And basically, we wanted to tell these people, look, we know a five-year-old boy was killed. We know Mike Ryan did it. And if you uh, will tell us everything you know about that and the other crimes there, That'll be taken into account, or you can be charged as a co-conspirator to the homicide and all these other crimes, including the theft and the interstate transportation of the stolen livestock. So our, our plan was to go arrest Mike and do those interviews and, and execute the searches. Now, knowing that they had weapons stockpiled and based on what Rick had told us, uh, Rick said that they he believed they would resist an, an arrest because, again, they had that sovereign citizen mentality. They did not believe in the authority of anybody but the county sheriff. So we realized that first and foremost, we would have to have overwhelming force. And secondly, that we would have to get Mike Ryan and isolate him and get James Averkamp and isolate him and get them away from everybody else before we could do anything because we wanted to minimize the chance uh, of any kind of resistance. So to execute the operation, uh, we ended up uh, marshalling a group of 80 law enforcement officers that included FBI agents, uh, state troopers, uh, and sheriff's deputies. There, there was no city police force in Rulo. Uh, it was just the sheriff's department down there. And the sheriff's department only had a sheriff and two deputies at the time. So it was primarily state patrol officers and FBI agents. And we used both the state patrol SWAT team and the FBI SWAT team. So on the morning of the planned raid, we had a ruse. We came up with a ruse to get Mike Ryan off of the compound because we, we weren't about to go storming into the compound uh, and risk provoking armed resistance. Knowing that uh, they believed in the uh, power of the county sheriff and also because the county sheriff, who by then had become a trusted friend and ally, he was part of our investigation and he helped us a lot. We asked him if he would be willing to be the one that gets Mike Ryan to leave the compound. And he said, sure. He says, so we came up with the roots uh, of him calling Mike Ryan with a fictional tale about some problem with the registration on his truck and that he needed to come down to the sheriff's office and sign some papers and take care of this issue with the registration. So the sheriff calls him up that morning that we were when we were all staged and ready to go and says, Mike, you know, I, nothing serious. It's just some paperwork issues, but I really need you to come down to the office because if you don't come down and take care of the paperwork, then I might have to impound your truck. And I know you don't want that. And, you know, came up with a good story. And Mike said, yeah, sure, I'll come down. But he says, the other car's broken. Nobody here could give me a ride right now. Can you come down and pick me up? And of course, we were very hesitant to let the sheriff do that because we, we didn't want him driving down there, not knowing what might be awaiting at the other end. But the sheriff was pretty confident. He says, no, he says, I'll be OK. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident this is legitimate. So the sheriff alone drove down to this compound to pick up Mike Ryan. 
Now, after the fact, uh, the sheriff, whose name was Corey McNabb, Sheriff McNabb tells me that on the way back, after he picked up Mike Ryan, as they were driving back to the sheriff's office, Ryan made some comment about, hmm, looks like the National Guard's having maneuvers today. And the sheriff tells me at that point, he didn't know whether he was about to be shot, whether he should stop the car and place Mike Ryan under arrest or what, because it turns out the National Guard Armory was where we had marshaled the 80 FBI agents and state troopers that morning. And the sheriff knew that. He knew that that's where we were all staged in the morning. And he didn't know if that was Ryan's way of saying that he knew that we were there. So the sheriff just kind of said, oh, really? And Mike didn't bring it up again. So apparently he really did see us somehow or aware that we were there. But he thought it was just a bunch of National Guardsmen that were rallying at four in the morning (laughs) that morning. Well, I wonder why there weren't any black birds flying around and, (laughs) and, and, and letting him know. Yeah, apparently the birds weren't available that day. Yes, that, that, that is interesting, you know, and I don't know if he ever thought about that. Certainly some of the other group members did, because uh, after we arrested Ryan, they started talking, as we hoped. But Ryan's arrest actually was somewhat anticlimactic, but let me tell you about that. So the sheriff, you know, brings him back to the sheriff's office. That was the plan. And the sheriff opens the door to his office and ushers Mike in. And of course, Mike sees me and Terry Becker. And he immediately realizes that he's been set up because he knew I was the FBI agent because I had already talked to him and he knew Terry Becker had been working with me on other things. But of course, by then it was too late because the sheriff slams the door behind Mike and Mike had not seen that, but we had six agents lined up against the back wall of the office. So you couldn't see them when you walked in the door. As soon as the sheriff slammed the door, three agents on each side of Mike Ryan grabbed his arm. They threw him into handcuffs, handcuffed his hands behind his back. And I walked to him and again, officially introduced myself and said, Mike, you are under arrest on federal charges of interstate transportation of stolen livestock. And I said, uh, these agents are going to take you up to Omaha now and you'll be processed. And that was it. Uh, We had no intention of interviewing him because we knew we knew what we were looking for. Uh, and we also wanted to, you know, if he was going to blurt something out, we wanted that to be admissible. So we made no attempt to interview him. The only thing he said, which I found kind of ironic, is as, you know, as they searched him and prepared him for transport, of course, they took off his belt, they take off his shoes, uh, they handcuff him behind his back, they put him in leg irons, because we knew what he had done. But his only comment was, geez, you'd think I'd killed a bunch of people or something. All this for a bunch of cows? <laughs> you know, of course, we were thinking, yeah, you did kill somebody. And we wow. know you killed somebody. <laughs> so, of course, we start the operation then. Mike is safely in custody. So we give the word to the SWAT teams to, to move in. They move in. The FBI SWAT team came up from the riverside, marching up through the field. The state patrol SWAT team went in the front. We secured the premises and we're about to start conducting the searches when I get a radio call over the state patrol frequency that I had in my car saying, uh, you need to call the sheriff's office right away. You need to get back to the sheriff's office. At about the same time, Terry Becker gets the same call on his radio. You need to come to the sheriff's office right away. You need to cease what you're doing. You need to come to the sheriff's office right away. So, of course, Terry and I have no idea what's going on. And so we tell everybody, all right, hold in place. The compound's already secured, but don't start searching yet. So Terry and I rush back to the, to the courthouse, uh, to the sheriff's office. And what was going on was, as I told you, we had separated everybody. Everybody was being interviewed. And as luck would have it, two of the people that were inter- being interviewed at the courthouse by two different interview teams had decided to cooperate because as soon as they were told Mike Ryan's in custody, he's looking at a potential 20 years uh, in federal prison, and we know that Luke Stice was killed, and you know, you've know you got a choice now. You can tell us what you know, or you can be charged as well. So two people rolled over almost right away, and the first thing they told us was, James Tim's dead too. And that's why the radio calls came out, because when Terry and I got back there and we realized we were now looking for not just one victim of a homicide, but that we had two victims of of homicide. Of course, we had to get all the details on how James Tim died, where his body was buried. And then we put Terry Becker on a helicopter. He actually flew up and got a state search warrant for uh, James Tim's body because we had we already had one for Luke, but we needed one for James Tim's body. And we had to fly Terry in a helicopter up to Omaha because there were no magistrates anywhere near rural Nebraska. Again, it's a very, very rural area. 
Uh, so Terry gets back with the warrant and then we, we commence the operation based on what Rick had told us and based on what the other people that confessed had told us. We had a pretty rough idea. We, we were able to narrow it down to a, a roughly a 10 by 10, 20 by 20 patch of a field where these bodies were supposedly buried. So we started the painstaking process of trying to actually locate the bodies. And the way we, we had to do that was very laborious back then. This was in the back in the day before we had things like ground penetrating radar, which you use now, and you have other, other kinds of technology you can use now to detect anomalies uh, underground. In those days, that did not exist. So what we had to do was remove an inch of soil at a time. The theory being that if you moved an inch at a time, you would not disturb too much evidence and you would hopefully see evidence of where the bodies were before you actually came upon the body. We were there for hours at working into the night. It was, it was almost an all day, all night operation. But as we scraped off the earth an inch at a time, we did soon start seeing um, discoloration in, of the soil. We started seeing some different densities in the soil. And then all of a sudden, you could start smelling the, the stench of, of decayed bodies, uh, the un unmistakable uh, smell of, of death. And soon we could see the body fluids in the soil. And we, we ultimately did recover both bodies. They were exactly where Rick and the others had told us they would be. So uh, after we found the bodies uh, and, and they were taken to the uh, coroner's office, of course, Terry and I and Corey McNabb, we immediately went and got murder warrants for Mike Ryan and James Haverkamp. And I remember it was, it was late at night by the time we got to the jail where Mike was incarcerated and we served him with, a, with a murder warrants. And... He didn't say a thing to us. It, it was it was a very surreal scene. You know, we had him brought out of his cell. Uh, we served him with murder warrants, and he basically just said okay, and uh, he just glared at us. He looked at us with a, a cold, icy stare, and didn't say anything else at all. So they marched him back to his cell, and that was it. And uh, by then, we were all just completely drained. <laughs> it had been like a a, a solid uh, nonstop forty eight hours, I think. Now, I, I do want to, and I've always explained to people that a lot of times TV and, and movies get it wrong when it comes to murder charges and the FBI. So could you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, that's a, that's a good point, because I get that question all the time. Why were the murder charges filed at the state level? Well, murder is actually not a federal crime. There are some types of homicide, such as a murder in aid of uh, racketeering or interstate travel to commit a homicide that would give you federal jurisdiction. But a regular homicide, no matter how uh, aggrieved or, or heinous it may be, is not a federal crime, which is why Mike Ryan, as well as uh, James Haver, Camp and Mike Ryan's son, Dennis, were all charged with state homicide charges because there is no federal homicide charge. They were not part of an organized criminal group. Uh, there was no interstate travel associated with killing uh, with the killings. So that's why they were state warrants. Uh, and of course, we dismissed the federal warrant uh, afterwards because the, the state homicide charges, these were, these were charges of uh, homicide in the first degree with aggravating circumstances based on the horrific torture and abuse that the victims had been put through. So the stolen livestock uh, definitely took a, a back seat. Right. We dismissed those charges. The whole reason for the stolen livestock was because that was the heaviest charge we could find to arrest Mike Ryan prior to us being able to prove that he had, in fact, killed somebody. So, And, and like I said, it, it carries a 20-year federal sentence, so it's, it's not, it's not a, a lightweight charge by any means. But that's why we went that route. And, you know, that, that shows an ex a great example, in my opinion, of how the state and federal authorities can work together and can leverage each other's strengths. And, and in this case, it worked out perfectly because we used a combination of federal laws and state laws, federal charges and state charges. And the Nebraska State Patrol and, and the FBI, you know, we worked hand in glove. I mean, Terry Becker and I were basically partners for almost two years. It was as if we were in the same agency. You know, everything he did, I did. Everything I did, he did. We exchanged reports. Uh, we took turns documenting different things. So, you know, if you, if you were to look in the file, you would find Terry's reports in my file, my, re my reports in his file. It was a very seamless hand in glove type investigation where the two agencies worked closely together. I do, as you know, have, have a new book out about FBI myths and misconceptions, and I devoted a whole chapter to murder, murder in the FBI. Uh -huh. 
Was there a trial? There was. There was a trial. And, you know, the defense really couldn't say much, to be honest with you, because we had so much compelling evidence. There was a trial. I testified at the trial. It, it lasted probably about two weeks. We tried not only Mike Ryan and, and um, James Haverkamp, uh, they were both adults. They were the two remaining leaders because Rick Stice had been, had been demoted. And then Dennis Ryan, who was Mike's son, uh, at that time, 15 years of age, he was tried as well because he actually had a fairly significant role in the homicides, in the homicide of James Tim. Now, Dennis um, was not involved with the abuse of little Luke Stice. But Dennis was was heavily involved uh, with the horrific abuses that James Tim was subjected to. He was only 15, but he ended up being sentenced to life. Mike Ryan was sentenced to death. And in fact, Mike Ryan passed away on death row of natural causes. Uh, he was never executed because he died before he was executed. Dennis Ryan was sentenced to life, but he actually is now a free man. And he has actually turned his life around because he was one of the beneficiaries of the um, Supreme Court ruling that said a juvenile cannot be sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. I don't know if you recall that that ruling a few years back and yes. numerous juveniles uh, had to be resentenced. And Dennis Ryan was one of the individuals that had to be resentenced. And the judge resentenced him basically to time served. I think at the by the time he was released, he had already served I think nearly nearly 20 years. And although many people questioned whether it was the right thing to do to release him, apparently the judge made the right call. Because from what I have heard, I, I don't, I've not personally talked to him nor seen him. But from what I've been told by very reliable sources, Dennis Ryan has in fact turned his life around. He has completely refuted and repudiated all of the abhorrent beliefs. And in fact, he is very much ashamed of what he did at his father's direction. And he and his mother, by the way, who's still alive, Mike's real wife, not his wives in the eyes of Yahweh, but Mike's real wife and, and Dennis both have completely rejected everything that Mike Ryan stood for. And uh, I think the best way to describe it, frankly, is they are embarrassed and ashamed of that chapter of their life. So, yeah, it, sound, it sounds like Dennis has turned his life around. Uh, James Haverkamp served his sentence. Uh, he is now out. And as far as I know, he is also living a life uh, of a decent citizen now. So in this particular case, the um, criminal justice system worked as it was intended. You know, the people were held accountable, uh, they served their time, and they're now back in, uh, back in society in a productive way. And what about Rick? Did you um, keep up your... Uh, yes, Rick Stice. Rick? Um, Rick, ultimately, well, first of all, you know, s several people wonder why Rick was not charged with a variety of different things. And there are several factors. First of all, you know, the fact that he did have uh, sexual relations with his teenage girl, she was of legal consent age. So he, he had no legal jeopardy there because some people said, well, if this was a sham wedding, you know, how come he wasn't charged with statutory rape? Well, it was not, it was legal because she was of legal age. Rick did serve six months for the thefts that he was involved with. Uh, which he had confessed to. And in fact, as I told you, it was it was all the thefts that allowed us to get the uh, federal charge on Mike Ryan, which was the key to getting him away and getting him secured so we could interview the other people and hopefully gain their cooperation, which we did. So Rick served his six months. And the last I heard, he was living a productive life. I believe he's working uh, with, with a relative uh, in, a, in an automobile uh, repair facility somewhere. At one time, I, I actually knew where he was, and, and he actually reached out for me once several years after the case was over. But I haven't heard from him since, and I get the feeling he would prefer not to be found now, and he just wants to get on with his life. But the good news is he did regain custody of all his kids. So even though it took a while, it wasn't immediate. What I told him in terms of, yes, I can help you get your kids back, turned out to be true. So Rick is now living, as far as I know, a normal life. And as I said, he did regain custody of his kids, and they're all adults now.
One of the things that I find interesting about him cooperating is that he truly believed in the extremist group's mind think, you know, of being against and and being superior to people of color. And so the relationship with him and you, you know, being an Asian American is kind of interesting. It was. And and there are several interesting, somewhat humorous uh, anecdotes related to that. First of all, for whatever reason, I was able to gain Rick's trust because obviously he he ended up telling me and telling Terry Becker everything. I think part of it is the way I carry myself. Part of it is the way that I treated him. You know, I, I didn't make promises I couldn't keep. I did live up to my promises. You know, everything that I told him uh, would happen, happened. Uh, I was just very honest with him. And I also treated him with uh, a lot of respect and dignity as much as possible under the circumstances. And I think Rick actually ended up liking me, if you will. But I remember the first time we met, remember when Terry and I met him that first time in that Rack's restaurant? I didn't know it at the time, but after the fact, I found out that Terry was thinking to himself, because Terry was well well aware of what Rick's beliefs were and and the Christian identity movement and all that. And Terry told me that he was thinking to himself, this is going to be interesting because, see, I'm nearly six feet tall. And Terry was thinking to himself, I wonder what Rick's going to think about an Asian FBI agent that's six feet tall. (laughs) Um, So and that may be part of it as well. I mean, certainly being an FBI agent and the fact that my stature, I mean, I'm I'm basically the same height as Rick, which I'm, I'm sure he found unnerving. And of course, I don't sound Asian. But the thing here's what's funny, though. Rick, Rick obviously did know I was Asian. He recognized that because after the whole case was over with, one of the last times I saw him, basically our, our, our goodbye meeting at the end of the case, he said to me, he says, Wayne, you know what? He says, you're all right. You're a, you're a decent, upstanding guy. You don't have to worry about going to hell. You're going to go to purgatory. And he meant that as a sincere compliment. And I almost had to stifle laughing out loud because I knew exactly where he was coming from. And I knew he was trying to compliment me, but just the absurd nature of what he said. But in his belief, because I was not of the white Aryan race, I was destined to go to hell. That was his sincere belief. But because he really thought I was a decent guy, he was, I know he was sincerely trying to get to compliment me saying, hey, you don't have to worry about going to hell. Everybody else will. You're not going to go to hell. You're going to purgatory. So How nice of him. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I, I was actually not offended because I knew exactly where he's coming from. And I, in fact, thank him. I, I, my exact words, if I recall, are, Rick, coming from you, I take that as a compliment. So thank you. <laughs> you know, because I knew he was trying to compliment me. He, he wasn't. You know, he wasn't being smart aleck or anything. He was sincerely trying to say thanks because that was the last time we saw each other. And, you know, he knew what was coming and he knew that eventually he'd get his kids back. And, you know, and he understood the whole thing about uh, doing the six months, which some people thought was way too lenient considering some of the crimes he'd been involved with. But he says, no, he says, you know, he says, I got to I got to be responsible for what I did. I mean, he was he was very matter of fact about it. So, uh, yeah, that's a very interesting sidelight. I don't think he does now because the one time I, I've only really had one other contact with him after the case was over and he reached out for me. Uh, I was very pleasantly surprised. Again, it was one of these things where he calls the FBI office and the FBI office patches him through to me. And he basically just said, hey, just wanted to say hi and let you know I'm doing OK. And, and also to let you know that I don't believe any of that crap anymore. I think those were his, his exact words. He basically said, I now realize how wrong we all were and just wanted to let you know I'm doing okay. So that was about the last time I heard from him. (laughs) So in the time we have left, two things I'd like to ask you, when you joined the FBI and why you joined the FBI, and I would love to have you give me the last word. Ah, (laughs) well, I joined the FBI in 1982. I served for 30 years. I was very lucky. I had a variety of assignments uh, and was also fortunate enough to uh, rise to the senior executive levels. And I ended up serving as the special agent in charge or the chief executive of three different FBI field offices. The reason I joined the FBI was that I had had always had an interest in law enforcement, even as a young child. And I think it was a combination of some of the role models in my life. Some of my Boy Scout leaders were law enforcement officers. And also, quite candidly, some of the TV shows I grew up watching. I remember watching the FBI, the original FBI TV show with Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. And I just thought FBI agents were the coolest thing growing up. And I just loved that show. I went to college on a ROTC military scholarship. 
This was during the Vietnam era. So I figured I would have to serve one way or another. And I wanted to serve as an officer and, and not be drafted as an enlistee. So I went the ROTC route. And as a result, I owed the government four years of active duty military service, uh, which I fulfilled. And at the end of my active duty commitment, uh, as I was trying to decide whether I was going to go back to graduate school or try to find a job somewhere, during that process, I decided to submit an application to the FBI, really just to see what would happen, because I really did not think I had a chance of being hired, because I knew how difficult it is to get into the FBI. But much to my very pleasant surprise, I was hired and I ended up spending 30 years in the FBI. So at the beginning of this interview, I was able to read your bio to everyone. And there are so many great investigations that you were involved in, uh, definitely in the area of public corruption. So I would love to have you come back to review another case. Do you think we can make that happen? Absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. I, I have enjoyed visiting with you. Uh, hopefully, uh, this is a good good cautionary tale. You know, you ask about the last word. When I think about this case, I think about the dangers of, you know, falling into extremist views. And I see a little bit of that now. I mean, you know, again, uh, especially during e times of economic hardship, which fortunately we're really not having that right now. But during times of uncertainty, it's very easy to, to turn to extremist views, which is what these people did. All the people on the rural compound did not start out as evil people. As I said, they were just Midwestern middle-class people. But in times of great distress, they turned to extremist views because that was something they could grasp onto. And I think the cautionary tale here is to resist grasping onto any of those extremist views and, and to try to always seek rationality and common ground. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Wayson Dunn. There are numerous newspaper articles about this case and a photo of Mike Ryan and his son Dennis, along with a link to the true crime book, Evil Harvest, written by Rod Colvin, which chronicles this violent Rulo, Nebraska, incident. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, or anywhere you listen to audio. This podcast is where I talk about true crime. But if you also enjoy watching crime dramas and reading crime fiction, then you want to join my reader team. When you do, you'll get a copy of my FBI reading resource, which is a list of all the books about the FBI written by the FBI agents who have been on this podcast. True crime, memoirs, and crime novels. And, in case you missed the big announcement, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, is now out and available worldwide as an ebook, paperback, and hardback wherever books are sold. And guess what? My crime novels, Pay to Play and Greedy Givers, are now also available worldwide wherever books are sold. So if you enjoy reading police procedurals, I hope you consider picking up copies of the books in my FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad series. I want to thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.